Welcome to another edition of the According to the Scriptures. I'm your host, Doug Hamp. Uh, we're, we're excited to be here. Uh, we're getting close to the time where we celebrate uh, the birth of our Lord. And we do pray that you're blessed uh, during this time. I want to just take a, a minute and talk about uh, some of the issues that are going on, uh, if you are one of those people that likes to watch Duck Dynasty, uh, I have to admit, I, I don't really watch it. I've, I've watched maybe one uh, half episode or something like that, and it was all right. Uh, but I'm excited that, uh, that, that the, the founder of it, Phil, is actually uh, standing up for what is right. Uh, he, he, he has taken a stance on on uh, gay marriage and, uh, in fact, just uh, homosexuality as a whole. And he has uh, said that it is wrong. And so now A&E has uh, taken it upon themselves to ban him from his own show. Uh, Sounds rather weird. I don't even know how you could do such a thing. But um, it just kind of goes to show you where we are nowadays uh, and, and if you go to Drudge, they're calling it a duck storm. Kind of funny. Uh, but uh, HollywoodReporter.com is uh, talking about this. Duck Dynasty's Phil Robertson um, on indefinite hiatus following anti-gay remarks. Well, all he did is just saying that, that it's wrong, that it's sinful. And uh, now the LGBT uh, has uh, really decided to take him on and to try to take him out. You know, I, I believe this is gonna this is gonna end well for the kingdom. Uh, we'll see what happens in the short term, but um, you know he, <laughs> you know he's just saying, look, it's it's sin. Uh, it's uh, you know men are uh, you know if you're a guy, then women are uh, much more uh, enjoyable, and if you're you know a woman, then you should be with a man. But uh, a man with a man is just plain weird. Uh, he says it a little more graphically than that, but I have to agree. Um, so, you know, I, I do believe this is uh, essentially in, indicative of the, of the days we're in. And uh, Dave, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, yeah. I, I, we were Did looking that to... up today, and it, it just, yeah. what he said was true. I mean, there was nothing that he said that wasn't true. He may have said it a little bit more graphic than I would have said it, but yes. Yeah, he, he said it rather graphically. But, you know, hey, we, we all know kind of where this is going, I suppose. You know, it, it's really sad that we're in such days where our own president uh, is advocating very strongly the, uh, the gay lifestyle. Uh, I don't want to use the word gay. I mean, they're not gay at all. They, they stole that word. Gay mean, used to mean happy. Uh, now it's you know being used exclusively for homosexual, which is very sad uh, because they're not gay. They're not happy. Uh, they're anything but that. Uh, they've also stolen the rainbow, uh, one of the signs of God's promise to never again destroy the world through a flood, has now been stolen by this homosexual community. Uh, you know, I believe that we're at the tail end of the American society. Now, I don't know if that means when you have another 20 years or another 40, who knows, but when you, when you start looking at, at – um, societies that go down this path, and you and I have talked about this before, Dave, where, um, you know, at the Moody Bible uh, Institute put on the, the movie uh, Empty Cities, right? And they showed right. that when these uh, civilizations began to go down this path, uh, which ultimately led to homosexuality, which ultimately led to them just being completely wiped out, you know, this is where I, I see where we are, that uh, we have a, a man in the White House who is is very much pushing that. And now the rest of the country, uh, especially Hollywood, is, is also, um, you know, they're taking his lead. And, and so people that actually stand up and say what they want on his own program uh, is now being censored. Right. They got a protected status state because they've managed to convince somebody that it was something you were born with, just like being born black or Hispanic or something else. But nobody's born gay. That's uh, something that even the Psychological uh, Association of you know Worlds uh, agrees, that it's a mental, um, emotional illness. And it's something that if one person becomes non-gay, then it obviously isn't something they were born with. It's something that can be changed. So it's a lifestyle. And all that 
Robertson was talking about. He, I mean, he wasn't saying anything bad about any particular person. He was just mentioning that particular uh, activity is not something that uh, he feels is something that would be even attractive. And so what, what, but the hate is coming back at him from the gay community. So they talk about hate language or hate speech. They're the ones that have the hate speech. All he was doing was sharing a truth. Something exactly. that he believed. Mm -hmm. And that's true at empty cities. What it does show is that every one of those civilizations, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the, uh, you know, all of these different civilizations, when they reached a point of moral decay, God destroyed them. He said, I will wipe the memory of them from the earth. And that's exactly what happened. It's very difficult to piece together what happened back then. And even including more recent times, the Incans, the Mayans, and the uh, uh, people here in America. So when the, when the um, civilization accepted homosexuality, this is what empty city shows. When a person sins against God, then God judges that person. But when a nation passes laws that are an abomination to God, that nation falls under God's judgment. And that's what happened to every one of these civilizations. And it was a destruction that happened very suddenly. That's why all historians up to about 100 years ago said that it was moral decay that caused the destruction. Yes, there were secondary causes, but that was the main thing. Well, it was moral decay, right? I mean, it certainly yeah. was. And then the destruction came rather rapidly. I think the destruction came from yeah. famine, from wars, yeah. from other things. Those were the secondary causes, but always yeah. there was a primary cause, and that was the fact that they were not. They were, right. yeah, what if, you flaunting know, it, yeah, exactly. You know, rebellion and, and against course, God. Homosexuality is simply one of the uh, of the. Uh, the symptoms of a very, very sick society. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think this is the, uh, you know, this is not the unpardonable sin, if as it were. But, you know, it, it's just, it's just a little bit further down on the slippery slope. Uh, look at abortion; it's been going on for, you know, what forty or fifty years now, and uh, we've managed to abort uh, over fifty-five million babies, and I think that number is probably. A little bit, you know. I think it's even, you know. Of course, it's growing, unfortunately. But um, you know that right there, that was happening back in the days of of uh, of Israel and then of Judah, and eventually God said to Jeremiah, "This is at the tail end of the first temple period." He said to Jeremiah, "He said, don't pray for this people." He said yeah, it three Moabites, times. For example, I'm, yeah. It, it's it's one of the saddest places in Scripture, in my opinion where he says, don't pray for this people, because they had become so corrupted, uh, they were sacrificing their children to the god Molech, to Chemosh. Uh, they were doing it there in the valley of um, Gehenna, you know, the, ba the um, valley of Hinnom. And, um, you know, God just like, look, it's too late. There is a there is a point where God just you know you if we've crossed the line, he he's continually pleading with us. Come on, people, come back to me, come back to me. And so look, if he was willing to allow his people Israel, whom he loves, whom he chose, whom he will never forsake, he he allowed them to be destroyed. What gives us any hope? that we're going to do any better. Uh, in fact, I would argue that we're going to have it a whole lot worse than what Judah did because, uh, you know, they were still under, you know, his, his special protection. What hope do we have in that case? I would argue that we have virtually none. Exactly. What I've said to people is, says, I have more of a problem with people that say it's right when God says it's an abomination than I do with the people that are actually committing the sin. Because mm -hmm. they may be, in some cases, uh, victims to some degree of, of being molested as a child and they're yes. having emotional problems and various other things. And so I have more sympathy for those people than I do for the ones that are going against what God says. Yes. Yeah, well, well said. In fact, that's what it says in Romans chapter 1. It says, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Uh, you know, you've got the uh, the gay bishop, uh, Gene Robinson, 
uh, Episcopalian pastor. Uh, there were two pastors that, sh- that were on uh, Oprah Winfrey a couple years ago, and they're saying that being gay is a gift from God. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, what you said, Dave, is very important because there are there are many um, many situations that can lead someone to becoming gay. In fact, I was talking to a uh, uh, someone from my past. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> well, how should I put it? Uh, uh, let's call it a family member, okay, from a long time ago, and um, I haven't, haven't been in touch with this person, and uh, essentially. He was, you know, I was kind of trying to get at like his homosexuality, and and he was saying, yeah, you know, I think it could be my father, and because he didn't spend any time with me or didn't give me any kind of affection or anything, and you know, he said that, but then later, like in the, in our conversation, he's like, oh no, I was, you know, I was born that way. That's just how I am, and I thought, well, wow, it's quite interesting. Here he admitted that his family upbringing and his lack of father's affection very well may have led him to become as he is but then later he you know he in the same conversation he denied it by saying no that's just that's just how it is and we we do need to have compassion for these people because you know it could be that they were molested it could be that they never had a father that loved them uh there's all kinds of reasons that could lead to this kind of practice but the bottom line is you know whatever the reason is uh, countenancing that kind of action is not right. All right. right. And, and, you know, it's just the same thing, you know, if you become uh, a pedophile or you become an adulterer, whatever it is, uh, whatever, you know, your emotional baggage that you're carrying that has led you to do this, even if you're a murderer or a thief or whatever it may be, it's still wrong. Okay. It doesn't mean that you cannot be forgiven of that, but. It doesn't. We shouldn't be going around saying, "Oh no, it's okay. They're born that way." That's you know, where we have a real problem. The the problem is, and I tell this to the atheists. We had a debate two nights ago, and I said, "Look, uh, you know, you may not believe in God, and that's okay. Um, you, God takes you where you're at. You know, Jesus is the friend of sinners. You know, Paul said, of whom I'm cheap. You know, uh, we're all sinners, but we can say to God, Lord, I don't believe in you, but." If you're real, help my unbelief. And God will answer that kind of prayer. And you may say, well, I feel like I have a problem with this area in my life. Lord, help me with this problem. I don't feel like I'm on praying ground. Okay, you can pray, Lord, make me on praying ground. You know, give me the kind of righteousness that I would be that, you know, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Lord, make me righteous. God will answer that kind of prayer. God will take you wherever you're at whether you're gay or lesbian or whatever you are, you just pray to God, Lord, deliver me from this, and he will do it. Hmm. Well it may said. be a continued prayer. Mm-hmm. There's a fellow, Joseph Nicolosi, who wrote a book called Reparative Therapy for Male Homosexuality, a professor at Boston University, and he uh, came to the conclusion that it was like you said just a minute ago, uh, because the fellow, the, the young person, he doesn't bond to his father because the father is either hostile, uh, missing, or absent. And so he doesn't have an older brother or anybody else to bond to, so he somehow bonds with his mother and eventually develops effeminate and eventually possibly homosexual lifestyle. Well, at least that was his opinion. But I think there's a lot of reasons, like you say. It could be molestation or a lot of things that have been done to this person. They are, in some cases, victims. But that doesn't necessarily make it right, and of course it doesn't make it right. But they can take wherever they're at and just ask God to help them, and God will. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's the great thing about the King that we serve. He is in the power of restoring life, and and that's one reason that God is so against it because God is pro-life, not only on the abortion issue, but anything that leads to life because God is life, and anything that smacks of death, He's against. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, don't we want God to be like that, to be against death and, and actually for life? And homosexuality uh, is really a uh, a Dead Sea kind of experience. Uh, there can be no fruit from that. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, we've also treated children as if they're very much, you know, unwanted. They're just a problem. They're a nuisance. And uh, so... That whole mentality of let's get rid of our children, let's abort them, let's kill them, 
you know, even defining that, you know, that, that, that baby inside the mother's womb is just a fetus, which is just a Latin word for baby. Goodness. Uh, but, you know, all this starts to to compound in the snowball until we have uh, the crisis that we have now of homosexuality in our country. And, you know, personally, I don't see any easy solution for this. I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to continue to get worse uh, until, you know, at some point the Lord steps in. It's not to say that we could not repent as a nation. We, we can always repent. I just don't believe we're going to, uh, and t- to be honest. I, I just don't think that there that we have the heart to do it. Uh, I think we've all grown rather cold, uh, you know. You know, even evangelical Christians as well. We've kind of gotten tired of the fight. I mean, at least I'll speak for myself. I've gotten tired of the fight uh, here in California. We, um, you know, one of the most liberal states in the nation, and yet we voted twice against the homosexual uh, bills that uh, people were trying to pass in this state. We voted against it, so we had a majority that we would keep the definition of marriage being a man and a woman, and yet uh, we were not listened to. Uh, they just continued to railroad it through until now some, you know, one judge was able to overturn the will of the people. And it, at some point you're just like, goodness, how many times do I have to fight this, uh, this problem? Now, and you know, one maybe of the problems with that is once they win that case, now any church, penny pastor that speaks against homosexuality can be sued and that person, that church, will cease to exist because they can't afford the legal fees. Yeah, that's well said. In fact, there's even something called the gay mafia, and uh, it's a number of um, uh, essentially rich kids. That, uh, for example, I think it was the grandson of the Hormel uh, Empire, um, just you know has all this money and pretty much nothing to do. I'm speaking generally, of course, but, you know, he didn't work for the money. He was he inherited the money. And so he has all this money behind him to throw at the homosexual agenda. And um, no, that's not to say that that God can't do anything or won't do anything. But if we're just looking at the financial aspect of it, you know, these guys have incredibly deep pockets and, you know, they have a burning desire to see that they're they're. Uh, lifestyle is accepted. And you know, I think what, uh, what Phil Richardson did in, in the Duck Dynasty thing, w- what is so offensive, is that this is a, a show that's watched by over 9 million people on a weekly basis. Very, very popular. And yet, you know, he has stated the truth in, in just very uh, simple terms. And, and now that is uh, really, um, you know, thrown some egg on, on the homosexual face homosexual agendas face and and now they want to be recognized as legitimate uh in the world so <laughs> this could be a quite an interesting battle to see how how this plays out over time but i think you're right dave that we're going to see a lot more churches now come under attack as a result of this uh you know just where we are as a nation and uh it's it's gonna it's gonna get pretty ugly i believe yes and you might want to just for our listeners uh, if they're looking for good information on this, there's a uh, website out there called the Family Research Institute, and it's a medical doctor, Dr. Paul Cameron, and he's written one book called The Gay 90s, but he's written a, a bunch of tracks which are absolutely excellent. And when this gay gene thing came out, I was giving a lecture in southern Indiana, and he faxed me a copy of his research before it had even been published, showing that the person who came up with the gay gene was himself gay. And he was it was totally fraudulent and was not based on science. Mm. Wow. Well, you know, uh, just to segue into our Bible conference that's coming up, uh, you can go to the prophecyforum dot com and get all the details there. It's called decoding the end times. Uh, Dave, you're going to be uh, sharing in, in one of the, uh, the 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 the, the pre sessions. You're going to kind of get things going for us um, with. Uh, Agenda 21 and uh, Common Core, I believe. Uh, but decoding the end times, uh, what you won't hear on Sundays, February 21st and 22nd, 2014. It's going to take place at Calvary Chapel Pacific Coast in Westminster, California. Uh, we have a, a great lineup of speakers. We're going to talk about the Nephilim. We will talk about 
the tribulation. We'll talk about the second coming of Jesus, the battle of Armageddon, uh, as well as the millennium. Uh, we, we want to talk about all these things. We want to bring hope to the believers. We want to give answers to the unbeliever, and we want to show people that we are near the end, and hopefully that will, will be a catalyst to live a righteous life, to spread the gospel, and to just get excited about the future that we have for us. Even though the days are pretty dark, uh, there, there is just so much amazing, um, you know, just so many amazing promises that the Lord has for us. And, and we want to show people that even though we're in some, some pretty bad days, there is hope beyond the tribulation. So again, February 21st and 22nd, the cost is $30 online. Uh, you get an early bird special. Uh, for a few days more, it's uh, fifteen dollars the early bird special, but um, we're we're charging for this. Some people have said, "Why are you charging for this thing? It should all be free." Well, we would we, we would love to make this thing free if we could. Uh, unfortunately, we have to pay for things. Uh, so uh, until we can get all those other things for free, we're going to have to uh, just divide the cost among everybody. However, I think for thirty dollars, you know, if you were to go get a movie, you know, uh, you know, get a movie plus popcorn. And a drink, you're looking at 30 bucks. So for two days, uh, $30, uh, we believe this is a, a very good price. Uh, it is actually being underwritten uh, by someone uh, very generous, so uh, we were able to keep get the cost even lower. So we uh, encourage you to come out for that, Decoding the End Times. Go to theprophecyforum.com, and you can get all the details. I also want to remind everyone that my new book is out. I've been talking about that for so long, and I'm, I'm excited that it's finally done. It's, it's uh, the Millennium Chronicles, Road to the Final Rebellion. It is available on Amazon. I would invite you to go there, uh, get the book. Please do leave a review. I very much appreciate those reviews. Uh, so far, it's been getting wonderful reviews, and I anticipate that to continue. I believe that you'll be blessed by reading this, uh, you can even get it in time for Christmas uh, if you hurry. So just letting you know it's there. I will have the study guide out very shortly. And uh, read it the first time just for entertainment's sake. Don't try to you know, think about the theology too deeply. The second time, I'd encourage you to get the study guide and then go through it uh, meticulously and look at all the scriptures. Now, I've got over 2,500 scriptures in there. It could take some time to get through it all. But this would be perfect for a small group study, uh, perfect for uh, even you know a, a, a family home Bible study where you can just go through. And it's a fun book to read, but it's got a lot of meat in there for you to just uh, have, have some good quality time of going through it. So do check that out. Now, Dave, uh, we're going to be doing a, a um, debate together, and that will be January the 14th. 14th. That's Correct. right, January 14th. It's going to be at Calvary Chapel Living Word in Irvine, California. Calvary Chapel Living Word, Irvine, California. You can go to their website, uh, Calvary, just Google that, Calvary Chapel Living Word in Irvine, California. We will put something up on my site, douglashamp.com. We'll put that up uh, for you uh, in the next couple of days. But um, Yeah, that's at 17101 Armstrong Avenue, Suite 103. It's a beautiful yeah. auditorium, Irvine, California, 92614. And tell them what time it starts as well. It starts at 7 o'clock. It'll go from 7 till probably 930 or later because people keep asking questions. Yeah, and yeah, it, this should a be lot a of really fun. good one. This will be probably one of the best we've ever done. It's debate number five of the Christianity versus atheism, and uh, we've told them what we want to do. We have the opportunity to pick the topic this time, so we have. Tell us what the topic is, Dave. Well, the t debate topic is worded, is there a more rational set of beliefs than what is found in the Bible? Because they keep saying, well, we know it's not the God of the Bible, but there must be some other God up there. We're not saying there's no God up there. Now, these are atheists, but we're saying <laughs> yeah. we, for sure it's not the God of the Bible. And I say, well, okay, let's assume that you're correct. Who is it? And we can show, Doug and I will be able to show, that there is no other possibility. I mean, God has he's written the law in their hearts that they're without excuse. He's 
created his invisible power and attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made so that this could not have happened naturally there's only one other explanation it had to happen supernaturally and yet if you look at all the revelations of all the religions of the world nothing is rational except for the Bible I mean there's no comparison and what we're gonna do is show in detail we're gonna go through Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and all the different cults Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and everything that's out there and then we're going to get in even closer into the Christian realm and show that there is a specific Christian doctrine that is true because it's biblical. Now, there may be 60 churches out there that hold to this doctrine, different denominations. They're all very close, or most of them, in the evangelical circles. So we're not going to nitpick too much in that area, but we're going to show that, look, there is a very, uh, there is a lot of churches out there that hold to the truth of the Bible. And so a just like a fellow asked me at our last debate just two days ago, he says, I've been just about all these things. I've been having Muslims trying to persuade me to become a Muslim. We've got Hindus trying to persuade me to be a Hindu. I have people from the Catholic Church trying to persuade me to be a Catholic. All these different groups, which one do I believe? So I went through systematically and showed him what each one believed. And he, bless his heart, <laughs> he said, I believe you. Which one should I join? He was ready to because once you see what's out there, and the problem is you can't necessarily go by what an individual says about his particular belief system, first of all, because sometimes they know what you, you want to hear, but sometimes they don't even know what their particular uh, group believes. They haven't really studied it out. So we go to the original source. We look at what their belief, you know, if they've changed, we look at any changes that have been made, but we can show exactly what they believe. And it's nothing like what the Bible teaches. Hmm. Yeah, so we want to, again, invite people to come. It's going to be a great evening, January 14th. That will be from 7 till question mark, till sometime, till whenever we finish, essentially. And that's going to be at Calvary Chapel Living Word in Irvine, California. So uh, do put that on your calendar. Uh, I just want to make one other point. This is kind of off the topic here, but just on, on the, the Prophecy Forum conference, uh, Decoding the End Times, uh, there will be people coming from out of state. So, you know, if you're listening from someplace out of California or out of Southern California, for that matter, uh, we, we do encourage you to come. There are some places uh, around there. They're quite reasonably priced. Uh, we do have all that on the website. So we'd, we'd love to see you and, uh, you know, get to hang out and meet you in person. So, uh do keep that keep that in mind. What was the address again? Uh, it's going to be at. Um, let's see here. The address is uh, 6400 Westminster Boulevard, Westminster, California. Yeah. So uh, decoding the end times. That'll be a lot of fun. We hope to see everyone there. Well, Dave. Um, Okay, so let's let's talk about this whole uh, this this atheist debate. Uh, you know, we you I, I I've been able to do one of these with you, and you've uh, done a few others uh, with other individuals. Uh, tell us about the last one. What what happened at that one, and and what do you think was the fruit of that of that last debate? Well, we let them choose the topic, and their topic was: Does prayer work, or does God answer prayer? And, of course, they would say, no, first of all, they don't believe in a personal God. So no matter what we say, it's almost a non – it's almost an impossible debate to win because their presuppositions would say that there is no God, therefore their God can't be answering prayer. And then they use – try to find statistics to show that there have been studies done by Harvard and others, um, mostly amongst the Catholics, who say, you know, they find that well, the prayers of Christians don't change, aren't any more significant than the prayers of Hindus or Buddhists or any of these other groups, and they all claim that God answered their prayer. So, obviously, God doesn't answer prayer because the statistics prove that he doesn't answer prayer. And, of course, then they, they go out and attack the God of the Bible. One of the fellows that was speaking attacked it, and he quoted from, uh, Deuteronomy 20, verse 11, and he's saying, well, look, God, God uh, 
said uh, if they find if after conquer a nation and they find some woman that's beautiful to them, uh, they may take them as a wife. And, um, and then he says, well, but the ugly ones, God said, destroy. So I said, what's wrong with that? I was kidding, of course. But <laughs> anyway, they, uh, it, that's not what the guy says. And, and he says at verse 11, he says, And seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then, bring thou, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall be put put on the raiment of her captivity from her, and and shall remain in thine house. And so they are allowed to marry someone whom they've come. And this is a blessing, really, to those women. You know, they found someone, and the Israelites they're they're not killing the others necessarily. They're just simply not. In fact, God said right at the beginning, when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto them, and it shall be. If they make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be that the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So they had an opportunity to not, you know, to to join Israel. That God wasn't going to destroy them necessarily, but the reason is given. Uh, the reason that they are told to destroy these people was because their practices were such an abomination to God that they, they would have been, it's like a disease, it would have filtered into Israel and destroyed Israel as well. And we're talking about sodomy, homosexuality. Some of these practices would have permeated an entire society, and God did not want, he was trying to protect his people from this. And so, you know, but when thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites and the Mosquito Bites and all of these, mm-hmm. that, thy te- that they teach you not to do after their abominations, which they have done in the past, you know, unto their gods, so that ye sin against the Lord. So anyway, here is God's protection of his people, and then because they're a theocracy, you know, they're going to ask these questions. So God is giving them an answer. You know, what happens if I find a beautiful woman? Am I allowed to marry her? God says yes. That's all. He doesn't say to kill the no ones that aren't pretty. That's not – That's it. but this is what the guy assumed. Right. Yeah, you know, this really goes to the, the question of Bible difficulties. I used to teach a class on Bible difficulties. And there there's some pretty common errors and assumptions that, that uh, people make. Um, you know, very often, more often than not, they just misread the text. Uh, they're not reading it carefully. And, um, you know, just like this guy was saying, well, why does God say to kill them if they're not pretty? Well, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say that you're supposed to kill the ones that aren't pretty. He just says, if you find a pretty woman, you want to marry her, then here's what you have to do. Uh, so and then there's never a verse that says, okay, if they're, if they're ugly, then take them out and, and, and kill them. Because, you know, I mean, certainly... Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and, uh, you know, there's nothing to say that, you know, if you think someone's beautiful, someone else thinks she's not. Well, who cares, you know? Uh, so it's it's misreading the text. Uh, another time, we have uh, misunderstanding the Hebrew usage or the Greek usage. Uh, sometimes they, they've misunderstood the author's intent. Uh, but, you know, again, I want to go back really to the first one. It's misreading the text. Uh, more often than not, they have misread the text or they by the way in the that text. passage i yeah. don't mean to interrupt but in, the, in that passage it shows that the women and the children are not to be killed specifically yeah. so you know they yeah. are protect anyway yeah well no that, that's a, that's a great point and you know i i, I really I, I believe that so many atheists have become uh, as they are because they believe that the god of the bible is immoral and they see this huge discrepancy between the God of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the God of the New Testament. And, you know, they're convinced that God told um, the children of Israel to just go wipe out men, women, and children for no good reason. He destroyed people in the flood. Uh, you know, I think that we need to explain, you know, I, th- I believe that the, the Nephilim is a major part of that. It helps to explain why these things took place. But... You know, when we leave out key passages of Scripture, 
then people are going to become skeptical. And, you know, for the last debate that I did with you, um, I was going around looking at all these testimonies by atheists. And it was, you know, kind of funny. They're like, I wasn't, I wasn't born atheist. I grew up in a, a Christian home, but when I had questions, nobody could answer my questions. And so eventually I became a skeptic and I became an atheist. I mean, it's just, you know, it's the opposite of a, of a good Christian testimony. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I, did, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, but I became a believer later. I mean, it's just, it's just the, the exact opposite. And I believe partly it's because they have not gotten the answers that they've been seeking or the answers that they were given were answers that didn't make sense. It just, they were answers that were like, really? You know, I think Calvinism has a lot to do with that as well. Yes, I we got into what, that last night and we found, well, you know, God is doing this arbitrarily. Yes, Calvinism does make God look pretty bad because well, he's, he's telling the, that these people are not going to be saved no matter what they do. Yeah. And God has already determined that before the foundation of the world. He created them for destruction. And that's not the way the Bible reads. By the way, this whole passage is interesting because sometimes God uses the people of Israel as a tool of his judgment upon these other people who God had warned for 300 years Mm -hmm. to repent, and they wouldn't repent, and God had warned them through prophets and others that they better repent or there was going to be a judgment. God was just being righteous and just to fulfill his original statement, and he was giving them plenty of time to repent. You, you said this was Deuteronomy what again? Deuteronomy 20 verse, uh, 21 verse 11 was the one passage, but uh, it goes starts mm -hmm. with chapter 20. And yeah. verse 17, he's talking about the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and yeah. various other ites. Right. Yeah. I, I just I can't jump over this without, you know, reminding us that, uh, you know, we're talking about Nephilim here, everybody. We have Nephilim in the land, and that is a major reason why God says to destroy all these people. And, you know, I believe that's what, one reason that people are becoming skeptics is because, by and large, the church has neutered this. They've they've extracted this out of the Bible, said, oh, we don't believe in that Nephilim stuff. And so then when you come to passages like this, you're really between a rock and a hard place because now you can't explain it. It doesn't make any sense. You, you, you can't defend this God anymore because he's saying to do things that are immoral if, if the, the element of the Nephilim uh, is taken out. But if you leave the Nephilim in there, and I show in Corrupting the Image, I show that the Amorites were part of the Nephilim. They were they were part of that same group. And that's why God says in Hosea uh, 2 verse 9, he says, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorites, whose height was like the cedars, and whose uh, strength was like the oaks. So, you know, there you have uh, God himself telling everyone that uh, he is the one that, um, you know, he's the one that destroyed yeah. these these great big people. Yes, and there was a lot of reasons. I mean, that's one reason. There's also the possibility that, you know, they had developed diseases like syphilis that would permeate an entire society and kill everybody. And so what, without penicillin back then, uh, these diseases would permeate an entire group, an entire society, plus the moral practices that caused that in the first place would permeate a civilization. You know, f fair enough. I mean, they're, they're, that, you I know, mean there are things that we don't know right. about what happened back then, and right. God is telling sure. him what to do, but he doesn't yeah. always give all the reasons for it. Sure. Yeah, I just, you know, we, we, we've had this fun, friendly conversation before, <laughs> you know, that uh, – I, I'm a very strong believer that uh, we, as the church, have uh, helped some of these people to become as they are, because we've not given them the whole story. And they're saying they're like, "Wait a second, this doesn't make sense." And uh, but they say, "No, you have to believe it." You know, again on the topic of of uh, Calvinism, we say, "No, this is how God is." You know, God has chosen some. He's righteously chosen some to be saved. He's righteously chosen some to be damned. And they're like, well, wait a second. Time out. That doesn't make any sense. What kind of God is that? What kind of loving God would actually do that? And we're like, well, that's just how it is. You know, you have to live with it. And so they say, forget him then. We don't want him. 
And, you know, in my opinion, that is really where many of them are coming from. It's, uh, you know, the, the science and everything is, is not their greater issue. I think it's their lesser issue. Uh, their bigger issue exactly. is that God's, God is immoral. Yeah. That is basically what I've seen in all four of the debates. That's where they come back that they are more moral than God. And somebody asks, well, where did you get your morality? They don't realize that God planted it in them in the first place. You know, they, the, the conscience, either accusing them or excusing them, God put it there. They, they have eternity in their hearts. There is something that is, is inherent in them. They know right from wrong. And that C.S. Lewis wrote a little small booklet called The Case for Christianity in which he basically showed that Christians have moral values. Dogs don't necessarily have them, but people do. Where do they get those things? Hmm. Well said. Well, again, everyone, do come to the to the debate uh, January 14th. Um, now, Dave, you've been preparing a lot on the Common Core, and this is something that, that we've talked about before, but um, what other, what other uh, research have you been doing, and what can you share with us? Well, um, this thing all kind of ties together. So once you start studying uh, a little bit about Common Core, all of a sudden you realize that there is a purpose, a greater purpose here, and, of course, Common Core is just simply one way of the government taking over our education system. It's really a deceptive Trojan horse national program written by a national cartel, supported by our president and the Federal Department of Education, imposing national standards and curriculum on all 46 states that have signed on to it. Now, Texas, Alaska, Nebraska, and Virginia refused it. Minnesota adopted only the math portion, which I could never understand because it doesn't make sense in the first place. But it's certainly not improving education standards. It's, it's dumbing them down. And so we have to ask the question, well, how were they able to sneak this in under the radar? People didn't even know about it. Sixty percent of the people in America have not even heard of Common Core, and another 20% have just heard about it, but they don't know much about it. So how did they do that? And, and, of course, the question was, well, Obama had $800 billion of stimulus money that he could do whatever with, with it, whatever he wanted. It was a carte blanche. So he, he didn't have to go to Congress, start a national debate. He already had the money. So he went straight to the governors, enticed them with funding if they would sign on to Common Core. The legislatures had no vote in it because they were out of session. And so he not only bribed them with stimulus money, but he also bribed them by helping, allowing them to get out of the rigid requirements, almost impossible requirements, of no child left behind because they had to reach a proficiency by the year 2014, which was almost impossible for any of the states to achieve. Not only that, but he, they said that they would remove the Title money, the Title I money, if they didn't sign on to Common Core. And, of course, that's the money that goes to states to help them educate the poor and needy children. It's a big part of every state's budget. And so they were scared. These governors were afraid that they were going to lose all this money if they didn't sign on. But the Common Core hadn't even been written yet. Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of California, I mean, he signed on had no idea what was in it. Hmm. Wow. And, of course, is this even legal? That was the question. Well, <laughs> this nationalized education is goes directly against the state's rights and the U.S. Constitution. You know, it's a top-down, centrally controlled. It's not what our founding fathers ever wanted. They realized that by controlling all the information going into the minds of people is how despotic government and dictators take over a nation. Education becomes an indoctrination program, a propaganda program, and our founding fathers purposely left the word education out of the Constitution, and it was re for a reason. So it's, hmm. uh, you know, the, the, there are several education laws that go directly against what they're doing. And, of course, the question came up in my mind, what do they think is the reason? Why are they doing this? Why do they want a nationalized education? Well, 
there is a book by Stanley Kurtz called Spreading the Wealth, How Obama is Robbing the Suburbs to Pay for the Cities. One of Obama's biggest plans to create socialism in America is Common Core because it'll dictate to what teachers can and cannot teach. It's copyrighted. The teachers can't change it. They're allowed to add 15 percent, but they're not going to be tested on that 15 percent. So it really doesn't make any difference. What And by controlling all the information that's going into the textbooks, why? Because if a textbook company wants to sell their book, they have to be Common Core compatible. Mm. So they have to go on to this system. It's basically taken over control of all of our students uh, in public schools. And this then, is essentially this is essentially the Hitler Youth. I mean, well, exactly. Right? Schools, yeah. you know, that's what happened uh, in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, this was a program that Hitler used. And then Obama's also got a master teacher corps, which is this administration is formed, which will spy on the teachers and administrators similar to those in Nazi Germany to make sure that only proper pro-Nazi teachings were being taught and students were tra- trained and rewarded for spying and reporting on their teachers. And any teacher who dared to speak out against Nazism was either fired or, in fact, most of them were sent to concentration camps. You know, this sounds just like 1984. I mean, uh, you know, in in there, uh, Orwell talks about how parents were terrified of their children because the children would go and tell the school teachers what was happening in the home. So if there was any kind of dissension, any kind of uh, conversation, uh, it would immediately be uh, ferreted out. In fact, the kids were encouraged to do that by way of uh, what was equivalent of the Boy Scouts, but in the the book, I forget the name of it. But uh, you know that was that was their whole thing. I mean, they loved the kids when they were really little, but then as they got older, they just they started to to uh, rat on their parents. And uh, you know, <laughs> this this sounds like that same kind of mind control uh, that you have in 1984. Well, I wrote two doctoral dissertations on the subject, so I had to go back and look at what happened. You know, how did we get here in the first place? And this Common Core Standards is merely the latest extension of programs aimed at changing the mind of students in compliance with UNESCO guidelines. We remember Education for All, Mastery Learning, Clinton's Governor School, which was really a prototype for the outcome-based education, Quality Learning, No Child Left Behind. You know, they keep changing the labels, but the curriculum is basically the same. So I went back and I looked at what did Clinton teach in this, you know, his pilot program. And we find radical homosexuality, classical socialism, pacifism, feminism, abortion rights, animal rights, radical environmentalism, communism. Children were taught that they should not adopt their parents' morality, but come up with their own. In other words, values clarification. They were taught moral relativism. They were taught to be, they consider to be an intellectual. You had to be a liberal thinker. And some students actually committed suicide because having all of their values challenged was just too mm-hmm. much for them. Mm-hmm. So Common Core is driven by UNESCO, United, the UN Agenda 21, the Biodiversity Treaty, Evolution, Environmentalism, and Social Justice. Well, well... Dave, tell us. I mean, what's what's the, what's the big picture here as far as a believer? I mean, clearly this is bad for you know me as a a citizen of America, and I ought to be in, in, in I, shall, I ought to be interested just because of what that means, uh, you know, for for me as an American. But what about as a Christian? How do you see this playing a, a bigger part in in the uh, end times? Well. We find that the Christians are going to be persecuted eventually during the, especially during the tribulation, but even before then. And how would they be persecuted? I mean, here, Christians are the ones that they have all of the soup kitchens and the um, hospitals. Uh, Most all hospitals were started by Christians originally. Um, Universities were started by Christians to try to teach. I mean, the Christians are the good guys. How in the world can Christians be the ones being persecuted? What moral values would possibly go against Christians? And we find that this happened back in the 1940s. The globalist visionaries agreed that biblical Christianity must be quenched or changed before the world government could be established. So among those influential leaders was a Canadian psychiatrist, Brock Chrism. 
he was the first head of the World Health Organization, and I always ask the question: Does the world sick? Does it need, you know, has it got malaria or, or 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 some disease that it needs a health organization? Well, no, he's talking about mental health because he's a psychiatrist, and he looks at the fact that the government is not going to be people in this country are not going to take a totalitarian dictatorship. They're not going to want to submit to a world government. So we have to. The he said. The, this is too far ahead of the state of maturity of the citizens, so they have to somehow reach down and grab the kids when they're young and get them to accept this kind of mentality. So Chisholm promoted behavior modification processes that have been transforming American schools and values throughout the last four decades. And he says, we have swallowed all manner of poisonous certainties. In other words, the fact that there are truths fed to us by our parents, our Sunday and day school teachers. The results are frustration, inferiority, neurosis, and inability to make the world fit to live in. In other words, because we are taught right and wrong, he says this reinterpretation and eventually eradication of the concept of right and wrong, which has been the basis of child training, these are the belated objectives of practically all effective psychotherapy. The reason you feel like you're, you're paranoid or you're guilty is because of these values of the fact that there is something called right and wrong. So we have to get rid of that. In other mm. words, get rid of God, get rid of the biblical authority, and eradicate this teaching of right and wrong if we want to be healthy mentally. So they're going to eliminate a person's allegiance to God, first of all, patriotism to their country, and loyalty to their family, so it's teaching total rebellion against God, against family, against country. And this is what this is the goal. And who is the one standing in the way? It's Christians, because we hold values. We believe in God. And so we have to get rid of that. It's long been generally accepted, he says, that parents have a perfect right to impose any points of view, any lies or fears, superstitions, prejudices, hates or faith on their defenseless children. It is, however, only recently that it has become a matter of certain knowledge that these things cause neurosis. In other words, belief in God causes neurosis. <laughs> Surely the training of children right. in homes and schools should be of at least as great a public concern as their vaccination. So these individuals with guilt, fears, inferiorities are certain to project their hates on others. We hate homosexuals, for example, you know, because we believe it's wrong. Well, any such reaction now becomes a dangerous threat to the whole world. For the very survival of the human race, world understanding, tolerance, and forbearance have become absolutely essential. In other words, we have to tolerate everybody's pagan practices, hateful practices, really, there is something to be said for gently putting aside the mistaken old ways of our elders that is, if that is possible, if it cannot be gently, it may have to be done roughly or even violently. In other words, we have to kill everybody that doesn't agree with us. Mm. That's what he's saying. And this wow. is what's happening. And this is what happened with Stalin, who killed 60 million of his own people. Yep. While Stalin was implementing the scientific brainwashing system in the Soviet Union, the free West, Canada, United States, and England, generally ignored it. No moral outcry was heard when millions of Russians were slaughtered, herded into labor camps. Why? Because the Western leaders supported this Russian experiment. What's more, they were actually building a global network of research to impose the same mind control strategies on the rest of the world. So in 1948, two years after Chisholm took control of the World Health Organization, the World Federation and Mental Health, WFMH, was founded, and it would enjoy this consultative relationship with the United Nations. And so what happened was Chisholm, Margaret Mead, and other social scientists who wrote the founding document for this World Federation of Mental Health, their, their attitude towards traditional American values was social institutions such as the family and school impose their imprint early it is the men and women whom these patterns of attitude and behavior have been incorporated who present the immediate resistance to social and economic and political challenges. Hey, uh, we're, we're going to take a, a quick break here, but, uh, but we're going to continue this after, after the break. Um, Dave, this is incredibly important stuff. 
And uh, I thank you for all the research that you've been doing uh, to help the rest of us come to grips with what is Common Core. So we'll be right back. Uh, Hang on. Visit www.comein.ws today. Train at home for a new career in healthcare. Take advantage of affordable tuition, short completion timelines, and graduate assistance. Over 65,000 students have chosen us for these benefits and many more. Our school's commitment to quality ensures that graduates have the skills they need to succeed in their new career. Our courses include medical transcription and editing, medical coding and billing, pharmacy technician with Walgreens and CVS externships available, computer technician, medical administrative assisting, medical billing, administrative assisting, and more. Our programs are all approved for MyCAA funding, which can completely cover the costs for eligible military spouses. Students in the Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec can also enroll in select programs. Learn more. Visit www.comein.ws today. That's www.comein.ws. Visit today. Are they aliens or angels? Genesis 6 declares that the Nephilim were on the earth when fallen angels procreated with humans. Jesus said those days would come again. But who were the Nephilim? And what did Jesus mean when he said, As the days of Noah were, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Join us at the Prophecy Forum on March 15th and 16th at the Hosanna Chapel in Bellflower, California to explore what the Bible says about the times we are living in today. Could aliens be the strong delusion foretold in the Bible? Find out at the Prophecy Forum. Visit theprophecyforum.com to find out more. Lucifer and his minions have regained their freedom after Yeshua's thousand-year reign and are enticing the Adamites to rebel. Then and Christiana must decide whether to remain loyal to Yeshua and his kingdom or to believe in and follow Lucifer. Thus begins their riveting race against time to seek the truth about Lucifer and his former reign, to save their protective shield, and to find the key they need to gain immortality in the new Jerusalem. Find out their fate in the Millennium Chronicles by Douglas Hemp at themillenniumchronicles.com. Welcome back to According to the Scriptures. I'm your host, Douglas Hamp. Dave Lehman is with us today. We are talking about Common Core uh, in the next half an hour. We were looking at that before the break. Uh, Dave, you know, you are really uh, becoming quite the expert on this Common Core and um, understanding the implications of this, uh, I think, are uh, really earth shaking. And unfortunately, most of us are still in the dark about this. So go on with what you were saying. Well, the question was, why is the focus <clears throat> on reaching children with these ideas? And the idea is that the, the attitude toward traditional American values, the social institutions like the family and the school, impose their imprint early. And it's the, these kids that have this attitude that we should have loyalty to our family, to our country, and to God, once these have been instilled in them, it's very difficult to root them out. So they believe, and they have this idea, this concept of prevention. Well, the World Health Organization is talking about prevention. We want to prevent cancer. We want to prevent uh, heart disease and various other things. So that's a good thing, isn't it? Well, they have redefined the word prevention to mean preventing them from having loyalty towards God, towards family, towards our country. So they have to reach them early. So this concept of mental health that, uh, in fact, uh, you've you've probably used this quote before, but back in 1972, Chester M. Pierce of Harvard University in his keynote address to the Association for Childhood Education International in Denver, Colorado, stated, every child in America entering school at the age of five is insane because he comes to school with certain allegiances toward the founding fathers, towards his parents, toward a belief in a supernatural being, toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity, and it's up to you to make these sick children well. Well, that's the very very thing that the World Health Organization is doing, 
and you have what they call Nations for Mental Health, established to guide the national branches of the global network. As website tells us that the governments will be assisted to formulate, implement, and monitor, evaluate mental health policies. These policies should enable all individuals whose mental health is disturbed, in other words, they believe in God, or whose psychological balance may be compromised to obtain services adapted to their needs and to promote the optimal development of mental health of the population. So do you wonder why, how nations will define, measure, and monitor and promote optimal mental health of the population? It starts with a subtle, even secret legislation. In other words, they're legislating things like you have to accept gay rights. Otherwise, you're not healthy. You're a hate monger. You are using hate speech. So what we, we, we talked about earlier, uh, Dr. Mm. Lewis Alson, former surgeon and president of the California Medical Association, wrote this warning. He said, the proponents of the mental health program have been quick to elaborate a series of legislative proposals. And of course, this age-old subterfuge of collectivism, uh, who the only solution to any problem, be it economic, social, or political, is to pass another law, impose another tax, or establish another bureau, and year by year, new laws that widen the web of surveillance, new regulations that ban hate, intolerance, just because you believe something, that means that you, you know, are intolerant of others. And other broad, ambiguous threats to solidarity have been building an inescapable framework for control. So we have the blueprint in pra- place. It's announced by Surgeon General David Satcher at the National Healthy People Consortium, which met in 1998. Currently, 47 states actively involved in Healthy People 2000, Healthy City, Healthy Community. Initiatives are being pursued throughout our country. Hundreds of national organizations have reviewed the year 2000 objectives and adopted them as their own. No priority yet generated as much interest and enthusiasm as this one of mental health. So, you know, we, we're, we're falling into this, and it, this has happened gradually. I was trying to show how this is, how we're being inundated with all of this emphasis on gaining acceptance for behaviors that God says are an abomination. So can we identify the reasons why we fight wars? I was telling you, uh, I was suggesting this is the reason why uh, they're attacking Christians. Many of them are easy to list. Prejudice, isolationism, the ability to emotionally and uncritically believe unreasonable things like God. The only psychological force capable of producing these perversions is morality, the concept of right and wrong. So we've got to get rid of this idea that there's any right and wrong. Why? Because there's no authority like God to tell us what's right and wrong. For many generations, we've bowed our necks to the yoke of the conviction of sin. Now, this is, this is the director general, uh, Dr. Chisholm. And he's saying, we have swallowed all manner of poisonous certainties fed to us by our parents, our Sunday and day school teachers. These poisonous certainties include the unchanging truths and values that can't be compromised. That's why biblical Christianity was and continues to be incompatible with the world's standards for mental health. Many who refuse to conform to the evolving guidelines for tolerance, inclusiveness, group dialogue, and adaptability to the UN plan for continual change are facing severe consequences. So you wonder why they're going to kill Christians? Because we don't accept their things that God doesn't accept. Hmm. So anyway, we, we, we see this coming around and it's happening, and yet most people are unaware of it. And there was something, you know, why... <laughs> Is there any reason why we're inundated with mind-dulling distractions? Across the country, many Americans fill their time with trivia, entertainment, sports, you know, feeling-based rather than fact-based media, and unending streams of suggestive ads and propaganda, some of it almost unavoidable, but it fits together in a current transformation. Even Aldous Huxley warned us about these planned distractions long ago. Surrounded by a bunch of British Fabian socialists, he became increasingly troubled about the spread of totalitarianism. So after the deadly fallout of communism and Nazi tyranny, he expressed his concerns in The Brave New World Revisited. Mm. In Brave New World, nonstop distractions of the most fascinating nature are deliberately used as instruments of policy for the purpose of preventing people from paying too much attention to the realities of social and political 
transformation that was going on, and that's what's happening today. Well said. I, I remember reading the Brave New World. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't read the the other one, but uh, it re- was really the case. I mean, you, you look at that uh, Brave New World. They go to the feelies, which are uh, the movies essentially, and the, you know, there's always something happening to keep people uh, without thinking. They're even conditioned from you know from early a- early on to just uh, be content with where they are. Not that we're against contentment, but uh, the way that it goes about it in the book. I mean, they're they're actually, uh, you know, there's electrical shock therapy to help people get to where they need to be. Uh, I recommend people read the book. I mean, I think it was very well done. And um, but just a, a very scary picture of of where, you know, things are are headed. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's our that's our society today, isn't it? It sure is. I was talking about reaching the children with these ideas. You know, they're not going to reach you and me. <laughs> we pretty much are set. So they got to take care of these these kids. And this is what earlier uh, of these people are talking about. Uh, for example, the book Reconstruction of Religion by Charles Elwood, Ph.D., professor of sociology at the University of Missouri. And he wrote, Human institutions, sociology shows, are in every case learned adjustments. As such, the American Humanist Association understands the importance of capturing the children, for they have written, quote, In order to capture this nation, one has to totally remove moral and spiritual values and absolutes from the thinking of the child. The child has to think that there is no standard of right and wrong, that truth is relative, and that diversity is the only absolute to be gained. Well, you know, I mean, even back in my day, I remember, uh, you know, I'm a little bit younger than you, Dave, and I remember, uh, um, you know, just some of these ideas of, of not really having a strong sense of uh, uh, of uh, patriotism, of, uh, you know, just the things that you're talking about were already beginning to show themselves back in my day, and I, you know, went to uh, elementary school in the seventies and, uh, and graduated in the late eighties. But, uh, well, this so, was written in 1923. So exactly. And in 1928, Ross Finney explained the young mind is as absorbent as blotting paper. The ideas other people exert on insistent pressure, even upon adults, unless we're already possessed with ideas, which seem to conflict with it. You know, the Bible teaches that, that what anything, you know, said seems right until it has an answer. Mm-hmm. So, as a young man, a young child is so meagerly equipped yet as yet with knowledge, it can offer no such resistance. Accordingly, it absorbs whatever cognitive material happens to be extant in its social environment. It is the business of teachers to run not merely the school but the world. Wow. That's pretty bold. And they're accomplishing it. I mean, you know, we have to really admit that this is happening. This isn't some... Uh, some idea that's uh, maybe going to happen someday. This is already here. Yeah, I I keep talking about this frog, you know, that's taking a bath, sitting on the stove in a pot, you mm-hmm. know. That's kind of like where we're at today, you know. We're just fat, dumb, and happy sitting there. Oh, this is nice, warm, you know, and pretty soon, you know, that frog is going to be somebody's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, um, I guess what the things, what can we do about this? That's always a question that I get asked. Well, what can we do about all this? I mean, okay, so we see this happening, but what steps can we actually take? Well, there is something we can do about it. And uh, school districts in local, and this just, just came about, about yesterday when I found this out. There was a lady from Wisconsin who had done her homework, and she found out that the local school board has the legal right to reform your school district from the new Common Core academic standards that are being forced on school districts around the nation by state education officials. If a school district decides to reject Common Core standards and replace them with a superior set of standards, will that school district re- still receive state and or federal funds? That was the question she asked. Well, Emily Amundsen, director of Common Core State Standards team at the DPI, wrote, quote, Yes, in Wisconsin, each school board has the statutory authority to adopt the state standards or any other set of standards, inferior or superior, 
This is what is called local control. When applied to schools, local control means that decisions about standards, curriculum, and instruction are made at the local level. School districts must have standards. We all agree with that. But the type and quality and scope of those standards are left to the local school boards to decide. This has always been the case in Wisconsin and is also the case in almost every state of the union. In fact, Hmm. we're checking right now on whether it's true in California. But I believe it is. Uh, Orlean Corley is actually right now checking on that. Anyway, this this has not changed as a result. The Wisconsin adopting... Even though Wisconsin has adopted the state core, common core state standards, each district can reject them. And this is why when in Texas they rejected common core, what did the Obama administration do? They went to the districts to try to persuade them to accept it. Hmm. But what she found out was that they were not going to be uh, – they could not be um, – withheld the money could not be withheld from them simply because they rejected common core but this is not common knowledge and so what we have to do as individuals throughout this country is to make people aware of this show them what common core is all about because most people don't know and the the poor teachers i feel sorry for these teachers because they went into it most of them with the idea of being able to help kids to learn, you know, truth. Many of them, I would say, maybe even a majority of teachers are Christians. And they want to do the right thing, but their hands are tied. Hmm. And so they're being told that they have to do something that goes directly against what they believe. In fact, uh, one of the ladies wrote that uh, <laughs> these poor teachers are, are finding themselves you know, having to do what's wrong and there's a male stream of discontent among the teachers because they're not allowed for fear of losing their job of telling the students the truth, what's wrong with some of these things. They're having to be taught evolution. I was sitting across from a fellow Saturday, uh, a few, a couple Saturdays ago, who has a PhD in chemistry and another one in computer science and he was saying that in each cell of our body, there are just under a million computers. I said, what is a computer? Well, it has an operating system. It has uh, memory. It has a retrieval system. And these are literally computers in every cell of your body. But he was saying that one of the, one leading scientist was writing an article for a prestigious journal. And because in one of his footnotes, he quoted an ID person, an intelligent design creationist. Just the fact that he had even mentioned it in one footnote, it was not allowed to be published. This is what's happening in our country. So the p- fact is that unless we follow this pattern, they have so, such a stranglehold on our educational system today and even on the college level that teachers are afraid to even mention creation in any form, or they could lose their job. Mm-hmm. Well, this is what, uh, you know, Ben... Uh, Jerry Bergman wrote in his book. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Ben Stein as well. Yeah, yeah. But Jerry Bergman wrote in a book called Slaughter of the Dissidents because he mm-hmm. had this happen to him. Here's a guy with four doctorates and five master's degrees, and he loses his job because they suspect he might not teach evolution with enough gusto. Hmm. Just the fact that he was involved one of the leaders in the International Creation Conference. I don't understand exactly. They must have suspected that he may be not an evolutionist. But, but, but he lost his job as a result of that, and he's an excellent teacher. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we can do something. Yep. And I would like to close my Please. time here with uh, just a statement. And I think it's really interesting, you know, Uh, there's a five-year-old Antonio Peck. He didn't know his New York elementary school wanted to change his values. So when his teacher told him to make an environmental poster for Parents' Day, the kindergartner simply combined what he had learned in class with the message on his heart. He drew people picking up litter, child holding hands around the globe, and a white-robed man kneeling in one corner. Antonio didn't tell anyone the man in the corner was Jesus, but the teacher guessed it. 
Later, when his poster hung on the wall along with nearly 80 others, his picture looked different. One corner had been folded up, hiding the kneeling man and part of Antonio's name. Antonio felt embarrassed and confused. Why should Jesus, who created the world, not be in the picture? We can all take a lesson from Antonio and stand up for what is right, because he was given two chances to change, and he refused to do it. But today, students who refuse to conform to the global indoctrination planned six decades ago often face increasing pressure, intimidation, and censorship. And since this punishment works well on most children. In a nation trained to crave human praise more than God's approval, few will endure exclusion or rejection for Jesus' sake. Hmm. Well, I had a friend. Well, yeah, who, you've left us something to definitely think about. I had a friend who wrote, he said, you know, if you were a pastor of a large church, evangelical church back in the 1800s, and you told your congregation, if today the schools would remove any reference to God, prohibit prayer, prohibit Bible reading, and remove any display of the Ten Commandments, would you mind? If today public schools were to hand out condoms, teach sexual promiscuity and sex education classes, and remove all references to faith in America's founding fathers, would you be concerned? If today children were going to be encouraged to have abortions without their parents' permission, be introduced to occultic practices, and taught reincarnation through death education classes, would you mind? If starting today students were to be taught that there were no absolutes and no objective truth through values clarification, would you care? Of course you know what their answer would be. Again, we're kind of like the frog, sitting on the stove, watching these things encroach upon us, getting hotter and hotter. Eventually, that frog's going to be somebody's dinner. We need to wake up America. Mm-hmm. Well, that's true. <laughs> wake up, everybody. Wake up. Well, Dave, you've given us, again, much to think about. We want to thank you for that. Thank you for being with us. And uh, until next time, man. All right. Thank okay. You. God bless. All right. Well, everyone, we're going to continue on reading uh, from the new book. We have uh, been looking at a couple chapters. And um, I'm not going to read the whole book for you. You'll have to go and get that. I will be producing a an audio book uh, in time, but uh, we're we're not quite there yet. And uh, it's going to take me a little a little while to, to get all that created. So I uh, just have to ask you to be patient uh, with me in that regard. But what I want to read to you is um, from the book here. And this is uh, something that's happening inside the AFOD, or it's in the, in the, the virtual reality experience that uh, Ben and Christiana are actually getting to uh, see what happened uh, back in the day, back uh, at the time of the uh, the time of the Great Tribulation, and the the goal of 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 uh, the Antichrist and Lucifer has been to destroy the Jewish people. Uh, God has been speaking, uh, Yeshua, Jesus here, has been speaking words of kindness to the Jewish people. They have finally realized that he is the only way to go. And now they want to, um, they want to, uh, uh, he, Jesus is going to come back, or Yeshua is going to come back, and um, he's going to set things straight. So this is called the... Uh, this is called the unveiling, and uh, this is uh, when the veil between heaven and earth actually passes away. It's chapter 22 in the book. It's called the unveiling. Ben walked over to Christiana and peeked out of the opening of the grove, though carefully so as not to be seen. He saw a translucent walk away about 10 feet above uh, a translucent walkway about 10 feet above Lucifer's head, stretching out as far as his eyes could see in the direction of the city. The walkway appeared to be still partly transparent and perhaps not completely tangible. What is it? Christiana asked. It must be the king's highway, which will take us to the city. Antipas told me about it. I'm guessing that our discovery about Lucifer is the key that is making it manifest. 
Yeshua established it, and it is set apart exclusively for the redeemed. Who are they? Christiana asked, perplexed. They are the ones who have pledged allegiance to Yeshua. Mortals may travel on it if they are loyal to the king. However, no one unclean is able to journey on it. It is only for those authorized to travel on the road. No fool shall ever venture onto it. Antipas said it is by this road that the redeemed have returned and entered Jerusalem with singing and everlasting joy resting upon their heads and gladness and joy overtaking them and sorrow and mourning fleeing away. Oh, that's just great, Christiana said glumly. What's wrong? Ben asked, confused by our downcast face. How will we ever get on that when it begins directly over Lucifer's head, she asked, concerned, pointing Ben to the impossible scenario. Besides, I don't see any way to access it. Maybe the answer will become clear just as the highway is becoming clear. It appears the more right conclusions we make about Lucifer and his kingdom, the more tangible the highway becomes. Agreed, Ben said as he stretched out his hand to grab the aphod that was still in Christiana's hand. Immediately, they were surrounded by white light. I was born behind the veil and could not see through it, Antipas explained. Only occasionally did Adonai grant the Adamites access to see beyond the veil. Jacob, in a dream, saw the angels behind the veil going up and down on the ladder. The scenes Antipas was describing flashed in front of them. Adonai opened the portals of the veil so that the food of angels could rain down on the mortals in abundance. Elisha the prophet and his servant saw through the veil and could see that the great numbers of angels and horses of chariots of fire that were with them in battle far outnumbered the forces that had come against them. Another was granted to see behind the veil when he was sitting by the river Hebar and the sky was opened and he saw visions of Adonai. The veil opened slightly when Yeshua came up out of the water and the spirit of Adonai came down upon him. Several others saw the veil open as well. Yeshua longed for it to be removed completely, though he knew that its removal would bring fire upon the earth. Even now, Antipas stated somberly, Lucifer is attempting to regain the earth by contradicting just one of Adonai's directives. I am trusting Adonai will deal with him. You must hurry and be transformed into a new body before the covering, the personal force field, expires. When that happens, there will be no hope. The only hope you do have is to locate the key of life contained in the Chronicles. In time, you will understand. Only the key will grant you access to the King's Highway, the River of Life, the Tree of Life, and the entrance into the city. Now, hurry. Time is fleeing. As the white light faded away, Ben and Christiana's attention was drawn to the vast army behind the veil ready to attack. They realized that they were about to see the finish of the battle between Yeshua and Lucifer, in which they were so engrossed earlier. Yeshua sat on his horse behind the veil, ready to advance. Behind him were millions and millions of riders, plus horses and chariots of fire. After six millennia, John said to Isaiah, who was on his horse next to him, Yeshua is literally revealing himself to the world with his mighty angels and blazing flames of fire which will inflict vengeance on those who do not know Adonai and on those who have not obeyed his good news. They will needlessly suffer the punishment of eternal structure by destruction by virtue of exposure to his presence and from the glory of his might. The world has no idea of what is coming, Isaiah confirmed. He is coming in fire with his chariots like a tornado to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Yeshua opened his mouth and a beam of light pierced through the veil creating a shockwave blasting the inhabitants on the other side. A deafening boom immediately thundered throughout the world. Therion and Oracle were knocked to the ground from the blast. They lay flat on their backs and turned pale with fear as they witnessed the laser-like shaft of light, brighter than the midday sun piercing through a point in the dark ash-filled sky. They covered their ears to guard them from the horrific ear-piercing roar that was created as the sky began rolling up like a scroll from the point where the particle beam soared from Yeshua's mouth struck it. The veil which had cloaked the other domain from the earth was dissolving like a dark filter becoming transparent. Sorry, I lost my place. Therion Oracle and their army watched as dark, thick clouds began rolling out in flames of fire and raging bolts of lightning blazed brilliantly 
through the clouds lighting the sky. They then saw Yeshua step into the domain of the Adamites. The veil which had so long separated the domain of Adonai and that of the Adamites was gone, and finally they could see Yeshua. He stood there for several moments surveying the earth, which had suffered incredible destruction during the time of the Hebrews' trouble and had become practically uninhabitable. All the seas and rivers had turned to blood, and everything in the seas had died. All the fish, the coral, the whales, dolphins, starfish, shellfish, even the plankton were dead. Therion, Oracle, and all the kings of the earth and their armies, which had declared war against Yeshua by gathering to destroy the Hebrews, watched as smoke poured out of the Yeshua's nostrils and a consuming fire from his mouth. Their hearts skipped a beat as they fixed their eyes on the champion towering over them and the armies of heaven coming behind him. Everyone on the entire planet saw his brighter than the sun radiance and the powerful beams of light coming out from his hands and the sharp sword protruding from his mouth. They all lamented at seeing the sign of Yeshua coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When the people of Egypt just south of Jerusalem looked up, their hearts failed seeing Yeshua leading his army on a swift cloud over their heads. In a flash like lightning, Yeshua circled the earth in an east-west direction. The earth was began to groan violently as Yeshua and his army passed overhead. Like a great furnace, his fiery lightning presence began to set the mountains and hills ablaze. The continents quaked and waves of the ocean surged violently upward as Yeshua's army passed over, and they were exposed to his power. The degenerate planet reacted violently, finally being exposed to the brilliance and blazing power of the king because the veil had been removed. Hills collapsed and fire broke out, burning to the deepest part of the abyss, consuming the earth and its produce and igniting the foundations of the mountains. Ben and Christiana watched in awe as the removal of the veil left the earth exposed to the glorious fire of Yeshua so that even the dirt was melting with fervent heat and the earth and everything on it began to burn. The heavens began, declared the righteousness so that all the nations would see his glory. It appears in the Chronicles, Ben said to Christiana, that only the clouds surrounding Yeshua shielded the earth and the inhabitants from the full impact of his consuming fire and lightning. I think you are right, Christiana answered. Do you suppose, she asked while witnessing the flash floods on the earth's surface, he was displeased with the rivers, or was his anger directed against the water courses or against the sea when he came back with his chariots of deliverance? I don't know, Ben admitted, but clearly pestilence went before him and dead disease followed behind him. They both watched as all over the earth people were wailing and lamenting as fear flooded over them. For so long, Christiana realized, they had foolishly said in their hearts that there was no king, no creator. Now, for the first time since the fall, the Adamites could see directly into the utter, other realm beyond the veil, and they realized that death would soon be upon them. The Chronicles focused on Yeshua again, who with a nod gave the command to Gabriel and the other commanders of his army. Each knew their mission, to gather all the things that offend out of Yeshua's kingdom. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Therion's chief commander asked. Who among us can live with everlasting flames? The great day of Yeshua's wrath has come, and who is able to endure it? Many around the world struggled to say, being short of breath and barely able to vocalize their words as fear gripped them tenaciously. All who were able traveled as fast as they could to their underground bunkers and even entire cities they had built for themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They shut the reinforced nuclear blast doors of their secret underground command posts around the world. They imagined that under the cover of the mountains and rocks, they could hide themselves from the face of the one who sat on the throne and from the wrath of Yeshua. At last, Isaiah said to John as they rode their horses among Yeshua's army, their lofty looks are humbled, their haughtiness is bowed down, and the king alone shall be exalted this day. Everything proud and lofty, of all the high towers of the Adamites, every fortified wall and every ship begin, uh, shall be brought to ruin today. They wanted to be gods, John responded, by taking the mark of Therion and transforming their DNA. And they wanted to lift themselves up to the highest place. But all they can do now is go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the great king and the glory of his majesty. Now that he has risen to shake the earth mightily, 
In just a few moments, they circled the earth and arrived back where they started. They flew east to west over Teman, Jordan, the area of Bozra, where the other Hebrews, who had heeded Yeshua's warning, had fled when they saw the destruction, destructive abominations set up by Oracle and were being protected from the awful time of trouble. Yeshua's eyes were fixed on rescuing those who had recently called upon him in the lower Jerusalem. Chapter 23, Judgment in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Wait, Therion shouted as he defiantly regained his footing, shielding himself from the massive hail raining down. Not all is lost. Go and destroy the Hebrews. Their death is our victory. Therion's hybrid soldiers, upon hearing Therion's command, both audibly and telepathically, lifted themselves up off the ground as they dodged the falling hail the size of grapefruits. With even more purpose in their mission, they rushed with all of their superhuman strength upon the perimeter of their Hebrews, and while still thirty feet away, leapt with all their swords raised to strike in midair. Caleb and the Hebrews felt had felt an infusion of angel-type power course through their bodies. It began welling up in them the moment they saw the sky begin to disappear. They sensed the power of fire, like a torch igniting fire to harvested grain rising up within them. All the Knesset members of the, on the periphery of the huddled multitude quickly stretched out their hands. Rays of fire burst out from their fingers. At that moment, the hybrids lunged at them, setting their attackers ablaze. The hybrids began falling like bad apples from a tree as the engulfing flame devoured them. Our strength is from Adonai and through Yeshua, the leader of the heavenly armies. Caleb and the other leaders of the city shouted with all their might as they continued blasting wave after wave of the hundreds of millions of hybrid soldiers and rebel watchers who yearned for their destruction. Smash them to pieces, one of the Knesset members bellowed. He has made our strength like iron and our feet like bronze. At the same time, those being taken into captivity by the forces of Therion felt the same surge of power, so that those who were feeble among them became like David, and the men became like angels, be breaking their handcuffs and shooting out flames from their hands, killing their captors. The light of Yeshua grew stronger and more focused above them, to the point of overwhelming blindness. Yeshua was riding his horse toward the Mountain of Olives, adjacent to the lower Jerusalem, the very place from where he had ascended approximately 2,000 years earlier. His horse touched down on the mountain, running to break its speed. The horse snorted enthusiastically, sensing its master, the master, had come to fight. Yeshua looked down at the situation. His eyes blazed full of pure fury, appalled that there was no one to help his people, and no one gave support. By my own arm I will bring salvation for me, he said. He then swung his leg over one side of his horse and for the first time in 2,000 years jumped to the ground with a thundering boom as if he weighed more than all of the mountains of the world together. The reverberations created an earthquake so large that the world had never experienced anything of such magnitude in all of history. The ground under his feet began smoking from his very fiery power. It, sl it slowly started turning into molten lava. A massive crack quickly spread from out, out from under his feet running east to west the ground pulled apart and the mountain began to open up the forces of therion fell to the ground stunned by the mountain rocking under their feet the mountain rumbled and separated with one side moving toward the north and the other side moving toward the south creeping creating a deep canyon with jagged rock walls rising up about 400 feet the mouth of the canyon was approximately 500 feet across Large chunks of mountain fell on some of Therion's soldiers, burying them alive. All over the world, every high mountain and lofty hill began to break apart and crumble. All the stately cedars of Lebanon and all the oaks of Bashan fell over. The towers erected by the Adamites at the height of their arrogance staggered under the enormity of the earthquake until finally, one by one, they crashed to the ground. Tsunamis crashed into the ships of the world, sinking every one of them. Not a single high mountain was left intact, and every island fell into the seas. Large portions of the earth were shattered and split apart. It was so violently shaken that it began to reel to and fro, like a drunkard and sway like a hut. It was moved out of its normal orbit, so that the sun and moon stood still on their paths in the sky. The earth was broken beyond recovery. After several minutes of shaking, Caleb pushed himself up. He saw all the forces of Therion on the ground. Some were dead from the massive boulders from 
the earthquake. Most, however, were merely stunned, and some had already begun regaining their footing. No one appeared to be injured amongst the Hebrews. Caleb looked up where Yeshua was and immediately saw the newly formed canyon that seemed to reach as far as Azal. Come on, run into the gorge, he shouted, realizing Yeshua had made a way of escape. Flee through the mountain. The Hebrews quickly picked themselves up and started running for their lives into the canyon until finally the last of the group had entered and were running faster than ever in their entire lives. Caleb and the others on the periphery maintained their position, blasting bursts of fire from their hands as the seemingly countless horde of hybrids were once again advancing like a tsunami. Soon thousands of Yeshua's radiant angels swooped in to lift the Hebrews off the ground and hurry them through the mountain pass to Azal. Caleb and the remaining Hebrews lingered behind to hold back the attackers. They continued shooting intensely, but the hordes of attackers were like a surging river. Suddenly, angels swept in from above as the hordes were about to overwhelm Caleb and the others. The angels sped them along near the floor of the canyon. As the angel whisked them, him along, Caleb stared anxiously back down the canyon, wondering what would happen as he saw hundreds of thousands of soldiers running at them with superhuman strength and speed. Immediately, walls of water and millions of people passing through on dry ground flashed through his mind. Caleb meditated on the ancient moment. Without warning, Yeshua shouted out like a piercing trumpet. Michael and his legions recognized the signal and flew out with a flash to gather the rest of the Hebrews, Yeshua's elect, from the four corners of the earth. Yeshua then leapt off the side of the newly formed cliff where he had been standing and dropped into the midpoint of the canyon, interposing himself between the forces of Therion and the Hebrews. He squared off with the attackers, many of them charging on horses. The angels and Hebrews who were watching realized the day of vengeance was in his heart, and the year for his redeeming work had come. The attackers at the front of the charge stopped dead in their tracks in great terror when they gazed on the all-powerful one standing before them, with flaming eyes and a covering of flame and fire. His, he lifted his hands, directing shafts of light and bolts of fierce lightning, lashing out at his enemies on every side. Like an archer with a bow, he commissioned his arrows that each would find its mark. He opened his mouth, emitting the light particle beam and cut in half all who were in front of him. The attackers from behind kept pressing forward while those in front attempted to retreat. Great confusion ensued. The horses were struck with blindness, and those advancing and those retreating began killing one another. With their own weapons, Yeshua was destroying those who rushed out like a whirlwind, thinking the Hebrews would be easy prey. The influx of soldiers did not dissipate because those at the rear perceived that they were needed to destroy the enemy when, in fact, they were killing one another. The commander, the chief commander of Therion's armies, who was leading in the attack, at once felt the intense heat of Yeshua's fire and lightning. He felt his flesh begin to dissolve, and his eyes started sizzling in their sockets. Who was able to stand in his presence were the last words he uttered before even his tongue liquefied in his mouth, and he melted away. Yeshua angrily walked upon the commander's body, trotting as if it were a grape in a winepress, which he fiercely did on body. Uh, after body until he was walking on top of a mount of wasted corpses of the attackers. He kept trampling on the bodies while gaining on the living, which he continued to cut in half to the waist with their blood spraying on his garments. The oncoming forces froze with fear as Yeshua quickly moved and decisively, moved quickly and decisively, filled with rage as he poured out their blood on the ground. Still the forces of Therion kept funneling into the canyon, not realizing the fate that awaited them. Hours passed as he continued his onslaught. Yeshua advanced to the canyon and into the valley of Jehoshaphat, trampling his enemies under his feet, crushing the heads of the wicked and laying bare their bones from head to toe in order to rescue his chosen people. His garments were splattered with their blood as he appeared the whole time to be treading grapes in the valley of his winepress. The earthquake lengthened that day, Antipas suddenly said, as everything turned white, and then they saw ancient Adamites dressed in leather and semi-armored battle gear appearing as Adamite-looking men, tall as trees fleeing before them. It was just like the long day of Yehoshua, who needed more time to rout the Amorim, who were as tall as cedars and strong as the oak trees, because they were fighting against the accursed hybrid Nephilim. 
Adonai listened to the voice of the Adamite, so that the sun stood still and the moon stood in its place until the nation settled its score with its enemies. There have never been there has never been a day like this since before or since at Antipas continued. That is until now. Adonai once again caused the sun and the moon to stand still in their habitation in order to defeat the rebel watchers and the recipients of the mark of Therion, the Nephilim hybrids. He trampled so many for so long that the blood flowed so high it could reach a horse's bridle for a total of 5.7 miles cubed. White covered the ancient scene and once again Ben and Christiana witnessed the epic battle. Therion, Oracle, Lucifer, and the other rebel watchers realized that they were defeated and launched up into the sky and spread out in every direction. Yeshua looked up, raised his hands, and billions of bolts of lightning like fiery arrows shot up at each of the rebels. Each sharpened ju judgment-laden bolt hit its mark, piercing it and sending it to the ground. At last, Yeshua is executing his foes and repaying those who have hated him, Isaiah marveled. He is the only true king, John answered. He is the living God and the everlasting king. In his anger, the earth shakes, and not one among the nations is able to stand against his fury. Those gods, Isaiah said mockingly, those rebel watchers who made neither the heavens nor the earth are about to disappear from the earth and from under the heavens. Their lives, however, will be prolonged for a season and a year. The watchers all crumpled to the ground, and in an instant, Yeshua's angels swooped down upon them, each having a heavy chain in their hands. A mighty angel stood towering over Lucifer, who lay defeated on the ground, and bound him with the unbreakable chain. Lucifer lost his proud look for the first time in 6,000 years. This is the time Yeshua had reserved to oppose all who are proud, haughty, and self-exalting. Now they are humbled, Isaiah exult, exclaimed. Everyone who has exalted himself has been brought low, and the king is exalted this day. And there we will end for today. I do hope you're able to get a copy of the book and read it for yourself. I know that you'll love it. Uh, it is available on Amazon.com. You can go and check it out, The Millennium Chronicles by Douglas Hamm. Uh, please leave uh, some comments. I'd love to hear what you think of the book. It means a lot to me. Until next week, many blessings. God take care. Bye-bye.